Okay, now we're going to move on to the next section of our week one, and that's talking about the Mycenaean period. Now, if we were sitting in the classroom, I would ask you, um, think of what's the first thing that pops into your head when you think of ancient Greece? And my guess is most of you will say something like the classical period, Plato, Socrates, uh, Aristotle, maybe Greek artwork, maybe the city of Athens. Um, and of course, that would all be a good answer um, because the classical period was one of the high points for ancient Greece. But I will tell you, um, there was a high point before um, what we consider to be the classical period, and that was the Mycenaean period. So this lasted from about 1500 BC to 1100 BC. And just to remind you of the timing, remember we just talked about the Minoan period and they were at their high period around 2000 BC to about 1500. And remember about 1600 BC, there was the volcano. So the Mycenaean period comes um, a little bit after that, 1500 to 1100 BC. If you're reading through any other books or any other material on ancient Greece, you'll see, or actually any um, ancient culture, you'll see it can also be divided by these um, other names for time periods. So for example, 1500 to 1100 is considered to be the late Bronze Age, and that's primarily because bronze is still being used, but it's being phased out by iron, which was a much harder metal. So. Um, you might see that this period is called the Late Bronze Age because of that. Um, I've shown you this map before. I want to uh, spend a bit of time talking about Mycenae and a few other city-states that, that um, were um, going strong during this period. So I had mentioned before we talked about the Minoans, about the Greeks invading Crete after the volcano and the earthquakes. And this is partly because um, Obviously, the earthquakes damaged quite a bit of the Minoan civilization and weakened them. And you get um, the fact that the Minoan cities, cities did not have fortifications. So the Greeks really took advantage of this and they invaded by ship and took over large um, parts of, of Crete, uh, the Minoan civilization. Now, what's really interesting is that, and you see this quite often when one culture comes in and takes over another, they don't just destroy it, they actually take over certain things. And so I've got a list here of things that the Greeks adopted from the Minoans. Um, so you've got writing. I'll talk about Linear B in just a second. Um, the customs, so we can read a little bit, especially in the Iliad um, and the Odyssey, some similar customs. Um, from artwork, we can see that the way they dressed, the way they did their hair um, looked very similar and some of the architecture and art of the Minoans. Now, one thing that the Mycenaean Greeks did do is they fortified their cities, usually built walls around um, their cities. And again, you know, I already mentioned that the Minoans did not do this. So in terms of what we know about the government of the early Greeks, um, I'll jump down to the bottom of my list because that's probably the, the more important one, is at this period, they had something called city-states. So they didn't have one country that was considered to be ancient Greece. They had a bunch of cities, cities around their territory. And these cities had states or areas around them that were under their control. So it's really city surrounded by the state. And so these, as I put here, they're separate governments. So each city state had a king or a, a ruler. Um, they had separate economies. They had separate military. Sometimes you get separate religion, and I, I say sometimes here because what we know of Greek religion seems to be commonly shared by, by other Greeks. Um, so now going to the top of the list, I mentioned that there are local rulers. You do get writing, Linear B, and they borrowed this from the Minoans. If you remember, we had Linear A. Now, we can translate Linear B, so we've been able to read these documents. It's interesting that these documents are found in city-states, and they're really government documents. So they're not literature or anything like that. They will say, we collected 600 eggs and 500 pounds of hay or whatever, whatever it is. So it's a government document. Now, this is going to be bad news for the Greeks when we get down to the end of this lecture where I talk about the fall of Mycenae in Greece. And what happens is because they don't have governments anymore, they lost the ability to write, but we'll get to that.
Um, in terms of the hierarchy, you've got kings, administrators, priests, and then everyone else. And I've already talked about the city-states. So I wanna jump right in and show you um, probably one of the largest city-states from Mycenae in Greece, and that's Mycenae, which of course is what the time period is, is talked about. Um, I have, um, sometimes when I'm teaching this class in class, we start reading the Iliad. So I've got a few sort of references to that. Um, we can actually read the Iliad. I was kind of worried we'd only have a short time to do it, but we can certainly do that. Um, now, what I have here is the entranceway into Mycenae. And this is something called the Lion's Gate. And this is um, primarily because of the lions that you can see. Now you're walking up the stairs, here's the entryway. And then here's just a close up of the Lion's Gate. And it's thought that this might even have had like a gold leaf on, on the outside, making it even more dramatic than it really is. And um, this is a shot from up above, um, from the inside. And notice how large these stones are. So they were, they were working in large stones um, even back then. And you can see for scale that there are people standing outside of the, the lion's gate. Now, I mentioned that the Greeks built city walls or walls around their, their cities. And early later Greeks looked at that stonework and said, these are way too big for humans to make. The Cyclops had probably made these. And this is another sort of a creature from uh, Greek, Greek mythology, which of course they didn't build it. The humans built these, but they built these, these very large walls around their citadels or their cities and kept them protected. Now, what's really interesting too about Mycenae is there are, there's an area that was outside of the city walls that had graves. And these are grave, they're called grave circles because obviously you can see that they're, they're created in a circle. And let me just show you. So here's um, showing you the lion's gate. Now, hopefully you're seeing my highlight, but anyway, here's the lion's gate that I just showed you. So people would walk in. now. This was originally, this wall here was part of the wall. And what they ended up doing is burying people here. And then later they decided to protect this with an outer, an outer wall. Now there's been some really interesting findings from these grave circles. So you have these objects called ritons, which are rit ritual vessels. So you can see this looks like a, a bull, um, or a lion's head, um, and then a bull. So pretty interesting. So 16th century BC is the 1500s um, BC. We've also found these decorative daggers, and you can see um, the, the lions on these daggers, pretty interesting. Um, probably one of the most famous objects to come out of um, Mycenae, these grave circles, was this, which is called the, the Mask of Agamemnon. So Agamemnon was a king, if you read the Iliad, at least we think he was a king. If you read the Iliad, he's the main king um, that leads the Greeks over to fight with the Trojans. So sh there's a man named Schliemann who is the archaeologist, and he claims to have found this on the site, picked it up and you know, sent a telegraph back to England and said, this is the grave mask of Agamemnon, which for him meant that this, this story of the fall of Troy and the Iliad was true. Now, unfortunately, um, tests have been done on this, and this grave mask was a couple hundred years before the time that Agamemnon, if he was alive, lived. Um, we also have these things called a tholos tomb, and this is actually a big mound. And what you can see, and I'll show you a picture on the inside, you would walk inside of this, um, and then you've got this mound of material that was built over it. So this is on the inside, so you can see these curved walls, and then dirt and everything was piled on top. This is called the treasury room. We don't know if it was actually the treasury room, but that's what it's, that's what it's called. Um, remember we talked about the, the Minoans being active in trade. So it's the same thing for the Mycenaeans. They took over a lot of the trade routes after the, the Minoans fell. So there's quite a few things and I've, I've given you a list here, tin, bronze, food, jewels, especially things um, um, lapis lazuli, which is a, a modern picture uh, of lapis lazuli because people still use this for jewelry. Uh, this beautiful blue, blue stone. 
They also traded in amber. And if you, you've probably seen amber, it's the, the petrified tree sap. And sometimes things get caught in, in that. Um, if you remember the Minoan pottery, the, the octopus um, jar, here you've got one that's very similar. And then on your right, you've got a, another vase. This is probably a wedding scene, the two people on, on a chariot. Um, okay, now I just wanna jump down and show you a few slides of another city-state called Pylos. Um, and this is the traditional home of Nestor, who is a king talked about in um, the Iliad as well. And what I wanna do is show you a bit of the palace. And this is um, the throne room right, right here. So again, this is sort of an overview. And then think back to the Minoan structures of their palace at Gnosis. This building structure looks very similar. Almost certainly the Greeks have borrowed some of the structure, the building structures from the Minoans, or at least the, the design ideas. Um, now this, this picture is showing you the same, uh, same image that I just showed you. Uh, what's labeled number six here is the throne room of Nestor. We also have some primary texts. So I mentioned Linear B being a governmental um, language. And this particular one is talking about, uh, this tablet was found at Pylos and it's talking about what is due um, from something called Dunia. So there's 2,200 liters of barley and I'm not gonna read the whole thing. But you can see there's 13 goats, a uh, fat hog, a cow, two bulls. So you get these sort of lists, which gives us an indication of the type of economy um, that was going on at Pylos. And of course, it also gives us an indication of diet, like what are people eating? They're olives and barley and wine, um, various meats. Okay, now I wanna jump to another city-state called Troy. And so if you've read the Iliad, you know that the Greeks get upset um, because of the kidnapping of Helen. Um, large numbers of Greeks go and sail up to Troy. They camp out for 10 years and then start um, a battle. So this story is um, written down by what is probably a person named Homer. We're not quite sure if Homer actually existed, but his story is called the Iliad. And this battle might've happened around 1200 BC. So I just mentioned that Helen was kidnapped um, by Paris. Now there's a number of different stories about Helen. Sometimes she goes with Paris willingly. Um, she is married. Um, but she is either kidnapped or leaves willingly and goes to Troy. And then the Greeks under King Agamemnon um, organize and get invaded. Now I should say here, it's not on the slide, Helen is the queen of Sparta. So Sparta plays a very, very important role later in Greek history. Now what you're looking at here is an archeological sort of cross cut of the site of Troy. So this is sort of ground where you can see my highlight wood that hasn't been built on. And then you, then you have all these different layers and all these layers are, are dated. I'll show you that in just a second. But you can see down here, sort of the prehistorical age, meaning before writing. The age of Mycenae is this purple. And then the Roman age, not surprisingly, is on the very, very top of this, this pile. And again, don't write these dates down because it's not all that important. Um, these layers are named, are labeled one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so Troy one is about 3000 BC to 2600. Now, if the, the Trojan War happened, it happened in this layers of, uh, layer of uh, between Troy six and Troy seven. And sometimes they're even um, sub-labeled with Troy A and it gives you the date here. And then what you're seeing here is that same sort of cross cut of Troy, except this time someone has um, built up the different archeological layers of what Troy might've looked like. So Troy six is probably the time point when you've got the Trojan War, if it actually happened. Now this site is also called Hiserlik. It's called Troy, Ilium, Ilios, which is where we get the, the, the name of Iliad. And this photo was taken, I didn't take this, it was taken by someone else but standing on top of the mound that contains all of this archeological site, looking over the plains. Um, and here's another shot. This one is taken by a professor who passed away quite a while at um, our university. Um, 
this is the top of the mound looking towards what they called the Hellespont, which is the waters. That's probably where the Greeks sailed in and they might have been camping out in this big plain for 10 years, getting ready to go to war. Um, the site is pretty interesting for a number of different reasons. One is you've got um, Schliemann, who was the archeologist that also worked on Mycenae. He was here and he was sort of helped a little, at least someone called and, or telegraphed him and said, you know, this is probably the site of Troy, you know, be careful when you dig. And he wasn't careful at all. He just took this like dug right down through the center, destroying things. He keeps, um, or he kept a diary and it looks like he, he sort of demolished some Neolithic buildings as well, but he was desperately searching for um, Troy. Now there are some indications that this was an active city. So Troy too, which is pretty early here is a ramp that was built up into the city. You've got Troy three or four, where you've got these building fortification walls. And of course, fortification means you're probably being attacked or the, the plan is to attack the city. Sometimes when you look at a cross cut of a site, you can, you can see evidence of a fire. And so that's what this is here. So part of this site during the period of Troy to burn. So it, um, it's, it's a big part of this, the, the city that, that must have burned. And then you've got um, these interesting things you can look at and try and guess what's happening. So Troy 5 is a bit earlier than the Trojan War, if, again, if it really happened. You can see sort of nice, clear stonework. Um, they've obviously spent time, time cleaning the stones and then putting down. Troy 6 might have been during the, the Trojan War. And just compare the style of brick with this type of brick. So this looks like it was rushed. And maybe this was done during the time point when the Greeks were coming over and the Trojans had to defend their city. Now this is Schliemann's wife. So the, according to the story, Schliemann found a trunk or a, a box full of gold from the Mycenaean period from um, Troy. And his wife ended up putting all of this uh, material on. Now, unfortunately, a lot of it is lost today. It got lost over time. No one's quite sure where all of it is, but this picture is fairly famous showing his wife dressed up like Helen, if this were indeed her jewelry. Now, at around the time of 1200 or so, which of course is right in the time when if the Trojan War is happening, it's happening. Starting around 1200, you start to find what's called the fall of Mycenaean Greece. Um, what's really interesting is that it's not just Mycenaean Greece that's having issues. So all around the Mediterranean, you have civilizations that are starting to fall. You've got the Hittites who are, who are in um, Asia Minor. You've got problems happening in Egypt at the same time. And I don't know if I have this on the slide, but in Egypt, You've got um, invasions of what the Egyptians called the Sea Peoples coming at this time, and they're coming in and disrupting Egypt. Um, and of course, you also have the Greeks having lots of trouble, so economies are starting to fall. Now, when you look at the archaeological record, you can see this. So luxury items disappear, like marble baths and cities, whole city-states um, just fall They, in terms of like population levels. And you can look at um, what's happening on the ground. So what you can see is that cultivation dropped. So people aren't farming as much, which of course is bad for any population. If you look at pottery, remember I showed you those beautiful octopus um, uh, pottery jars? You don't see that during this period. So people are getting um, back to the basics. So they're, they're building or making basic pottery. They're not decorating it probably because they just don't have the time. Things are collapsing around them, economies are collapsed, and you just need to eat. And I mentioned this before, writing was forgotten. So, and again, this is because Linear B was a government document, and when the government falls, there's no need to write down anything. And so those who knew how to write eventually died off and they didn't pass down their knowledge. Um, I mentioned that other civilizations were having trouble during this time. This is a primary text from the King of Cyprus, which is an island, um, to a king in Syria. And you can read this, you know, and you can stop the video and read it. Um, you have written to me, enemy ships have been at sea, where are your troops and chariots? 
So he's looking, the king is looking for help during, during this time. Now, you might be wondering what, what happened? Why did you have a civilization like Mycenae and Greece or the Hittites or Egypt have so many problems during this time? One possibility, more natural disasters. We talked about um, the volcano happening around 1600. So we know that that area is active and still active today with earthquakes and so on. Um, there might have been internal stresses like war. So remember we talked about the, uh, the Trojan War where you know thousands of Greek men left the mainland. They sailed to Troy. They stayed there for 10 years. It's possible that during this time there were other issues happening at, on mainland Greece that where you've got your army off and, and can't protect the mainland. During this time we also know, at least we think, that a group of people called the Dorians um, came down from the north around this time. And so again, if the Trojan War is true, you've got troops over in Troy, mainland is relatively unprotected, a group of people come down from the north and take over. And I had mentioned this, I, I forgot that this is already on the slide. You've got something that the Egyptians wrote down a, a couple of times called the Sea People. Um, we're not quite sure where they see people are coming from, but it's possible that throughout the Mediterranean, there were large waves of people who were invading this time, looking for new territory or treasure to steal. And it caused many, many issues, of course, during this time. And in the next lecture, I will look at um, the time period called the Dark Age.